we all know that it's the army which runs that country as long as that continues there is not much hope for any kind of rapprochement between india and pakistan imran one of the many damages it did you can say to the pakistani he asked the right questions right now where we are with pakistan they say for anything you say normal common sense thing they say no for salt kashmir china wants to integrate pakistan into the brics alliance i don't think it's a serious thing at least at this stage mm. the in the list of 22 countries uh, who've been already invited to come uh, the, pakistan is not there unfortunately what xi jinping has done by recentralizing economic mm. decision making he has sort of undone the deng xiaoping miracle which was the chinese miracle of uh, 10% or more gdp growth per annum main point about cpec godar is really how china has taken over the infrastructure development in pakistan and pakistan does not have too many choices i think one reason why the army took over i think de facto in pakistan is to get the economy fixed go back to the imf i don't think the west uh, being relatively muted means that they do not oppose the destruction of churches and the harassment of uh, people who are christian under ayub khan pakistan was a the great friend of america a great friend of china you know pakistan's weight was a is yeah. a global thing that has dramatically diminished so this is a tragedy of pakistan except nuclear weapons they have nothing there is no doubt that there's a very severe slowdown in the chinese economy it's not that i'm advising xi jinping on it because if he's making mistakes i will let him make those <laughs> yeah. mistakes that's chanakya neeti for you <laughs> <laughs> Namaste Jai Hind welcome to another edition of ANI podcast with Smita Prakash Today we discuss Pakistan and China and its ramifications on India My guests today have tracked Pakistan and China for decades Ambassador Gautam Bambawale has served as India's High Commissioner to Pakistan and India's Ambassador to China and India's Ambassador to Bhutan He's also served as India's first Consul General in Guangzhou C Raja Mohan is a senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute Delhi a division of the Asia Society India Center in Mumbai Raja Mohan has written extensively on Pakistan and China and foreign policy matters his article the title is Gulf Route to Pakistan the article says that the United Arab Emirates has offered to invest in Pakistan to help the country out of its entrenched economic crisis and that the UAE could emerge as an important economic bridge connecting the Indian subcontinent and the Gulf On the podcast today are these two gentlemen to discuss this article and more. Thank you Gautam for finally coming down from Pune and <laughs> coming to Delhi. Delhi all pretty dub for you. You've noticed we've done up everything right Raja. Yeah. We've right made this city so beautiful so that Gautam can come to Delhi yeah. and take part in the I'm, podcast. I'm lucky I came a few days before the G20 summit. <laughs> <laughs> no no no. We've done this just for you ambassador. <laughs> But anyway, uh so we'll discuss your article which uh we've been planning to talk mm. on this article that you've written very uh interesting but before that let's talk about pakistan both of you have written so much about pakistan and about china and you've covered uh, you've followed uh, the events there for a long time so i just want to know about this this current scenario you know um we are recording uh, on the 24th uh, and i believe it's uh, imran khan's thing is going to come up in supreme court and there is talk that he might come out of jail again so by the time we air this you never know he might be out but i wanted to know about this president uh, arif uh, alvi when he said that he refused to sign those bills somehow those bills get signed things are happening what is what do you see why do you think it's happened gautam you first yeah let me give you my input so let me give you my viewpoint i think this sort of epitomizes or oh, gives us a very good idea of the state of pakistan today hmm. that the president of the country wants something to happen but people down the line don't let that happen it sums up the sort of mess that pakistan is in today uh let me also say that you know we all know that it's the army which runs that country and in my view in my opinion as long as that continues there's not much hope for any kind of rapprochement between india and pakistan and therefore what we have seen in the last few months 
where uh, Imran Khan tried to take on the army but has not been able to do that, where there was popular anger against the army which was seen in those attacks uh, against you know, people who are working in the army in Lahore and other places. Uh, that sort of shows that the people in Pakistan, the populace, is now beginning to, at least beginning to see through the dong that the army was uh, is, is made of Pakistan. If that happens, and I had written an article on this, uh, which says that if we are able to push the Pak army back to the barracks, that means they take on the role of any normal army in any other country then that would probably be a good thing because then the politicians who are elected by the people of Pakistan could actually have a say in the nature of the relationship between India and Pakistan. So right. those are my broad views on, on what's been happening in Pakistan. Though, of course, economically, we all know it's in a mess. Um, they have, of course, managed to get an IMF loan and money from other countries. Uh, and let's see how they move ahead on the economic front. Mm. Uh, Raja, do you agree that is it... I mean, in 70 years, we've never seen a time, uh, even a brief period where the army was willing to move back to the barracks and allow. And with uh, with this kind of a president who seems like very confused, uh, whether he signed the bill or didn't sign the bill or somebody in his staff signed the bill. So what has really happened? Do you think it's possible, even in the r remote possibility that the army uh, is contemplating going back to the barracks? Not at all. I mean, in fact, it's come out of the barracks. I mean, mm. uh, I think, you know, to talk about the army in Pakistan, we, we always used to say, you know, most countries, the countries own the army, but in this case, the army owns the country. It looked like Imran Khan was breaking that paradigm you know, with his popularity, though he himself was put in that place by the army. By the army. It looked yeah. like his popularity, he can challenge the army. And as we've seen, his ability to do so has been uh, clipped quite severely. Mm. Uh, so, just as we thought uh, Army has done this to other leaders before, uh, to Zardari, to Nawaz Sharif, to Benazir, so they thought, okay, we, they put this guy away uh, to cool his heels in the jail and someday tell him, look, you want to go to London, you're free to go, but you're not going to do politics. But I think there are two jokers in the pack. Hmm. One is uh, Judge, Chief Justice of Pakistan, Bandial, hmm. who throughout the uh, cases that have come has favoured Imran Khan, So, and but his term is coming to an end. So the question is, can the army control him uh, when the cases come up in the next few days? Or uh, they can arrest him again. Look, in South Asia, the police, you know, you get out of on one charge, there are a hundred other charges because he just doesn't have one case. He has so many cases now put against him. And this now the new issue of Official Secrets Act, that by going around with this piece of telegram that he got from, uh, cipher telegram he got from Washington saying Americans were doing the conspiracy. So that now, that law has also been amended. So... Justice Bandial is a problem. The army has to fix him. You know. mm. The other joker in the pack is the president. Mm. The president was the nominee of Imran Khan. At a time when Imran was, the, was working with the army. Now, the problem for him has been, the army has come back. Imran is in jail. And the president, who is Imran's man, I mean, he's not elected, he's nobody. Actually, Imran put him in that place. So, the, P the PTI, the Imran's party, people are saying, look, we put you there. What the hell are you doing for the... For our leader. Hmm. And are you, you saying you're signing these new new laws which actually make sure that Imran will never get out? Hmm. So I think he came under the pressure. So he's caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. He can't really confront the establishment. He can't pretend he owes nothing to Imran Khan. So I think he's doing the usual thing when we get caught in such a situation, fudging, doing a Bharatanatyam uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, I signed it, but I didn't sign it. Somebody came and took the file away. I told them to say no. So I think he's you know, is saving his skin uh, mm. in a situation where it's very uncomfortable for him that he can't really support Imran Khan fully. He can't uh, defy the army. So he's trying to find the space. So mm. I think if he and Bandial, the chief justice, act in tandem, uh, they can create problems for the army. But I wouldn't bet against the army in Pakistan that right. they, they've gone too far now. Uh, they've taken a lot of heat already. Uh, they brought in Imran, and I think Imran has, uh, you know, has made it very hard for them. So they're not going to let go of the situation. Hmm. And uh, so they have to fix these two guys. One guy will go out in six weeks, and this guy... Fix uh, it. Yeah. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. right? Gautam, uh, you've been High Commissioner in Islamabad. Uh, tell me, you know, I'm reading a few articles now 
like truth bombs being dropped in uh, some of the newspapers, some of the op-eds uh, by Pakistani writers who say that, you know, we've got left behind. Look where India is. Look where we are. Uh, we've been let down by the army. We Bold enough to say that. I mean, uh, not just the army, bold enough to say that we've been let down by our leaders. You know, nobody wants to look at us anymore on the international sphere. Did you see this when you were posted there? There, uh, you know, did you see this kind of uh, discrepancy between what people want, what people think, and what the rulers do? No, that's an excellent question, Smita. When I was there, of course, it was the period when Nawaz was, um, you know, the Panama Papers had just broken, and Nawaz was in a very uncomfortable position and then eventually as we know and as Raja rightly said the army made sure that he was out of office and he had to stay in London etc etc but uh, Imran Khan was already a rising force and his, his party the PTI was a rising force at that point of time um, one of course couldn't foresee that this kind of honeymoon between the uh, PTI and Imran Khan on the one hand and the army on the other would be over so soon in three years or so, not even a full term for Imran Khan. But I think what you're saying is absolutely right that some cracks in this monolith which used to be revered by the Pakistani people, which is the Pak military, the establishment, uh, the Pakistan army basically, have begun to be seen. And increasingly, people are beginning to understand that the Pak army has not really done the country any great favors. Mm. It has kept the country together and it has, uh, you know, done a, a wee bit in defense of the nation. But in the longer term, it has not really done any great favors to Pakistan and to a certain extent may even have held them back. So there was a slight indication of these kind of views at that time but to be frank not many people were were willing or had were brave enough to put it down in writing and say it in public because they knew that big brother which is the army was always looking over their shoulder and when i was there we also had these five bloggers who dared to say such things who were who disappeared overnight and were then missing for almost uh, two to five weeks. Disappeared uh, is, dis a, is a term which is, you know, very, <laughs> no, very strange. Wo disappear ho gaye, uh -huh, which means... Disappeared ho gaye in Pakistan means they're someone. picked up by the ISI. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> picked up and what they do it's with them... It's used very casually, <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, but the first time I heard it, you know, Gautam, I was like, what do you mean disappear? Yeah. Like, it's like but, a word which was not something I was familiar let me with. Yeah. Let me tell you something, uh, Smita and Raja, which will really, you know, I used to play golf while in, in Islamabad and you won't believe it, the guy who used to caddy for me also disappeared for two, three days. Oh. He reappeared after that and I asked him, Kya ho gaya tha? So he said, the ISI picked you. him up and asked me what I say on to him on the on the golf course. And he was a Pakistani? Or he, he was, was a yeah. local Pakistani man. Oh. So, uh, you know, a caddy from the golf course whom I used to use regularly. So even he had been picked up by the ISI and quizzed and questioned about what I had uh, spoken with him. And his answer, he said, I told him that he only talks to me about golf and nothing else. <laughs> if only the ISI would know that Gautam doesn't even talk to Indian journals. Caddy se kya baat But anyway, no, that's a joke apart. It's an inside joke <laughs> that we used to have as journals yeah. when Gautam was, you know, like high commissioner. Bolte hi nahi mm. the. We used to keep trying to get some information, but, you know, till... The Indian High Commissioner is not ready to yeah. speak, he would not. But then I guess that's like your job profile, right? But tell me something. No, very often, Smita, and this is a joke also. People ask me, how the hell were you made ambassador to China and High Commissioner to Pakistan? To Pakistan. Is that so I told them, I have one qualification which you guys don't have, which is I speak very little. <laughs> But how many uh, uh, diplomats are there, Indian diplomats who have done both? Uh, I think, uh, according to our account, it's three. Okay, who are the others? Uh, there was uh, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon and Mr. Vijay Nambiar. There's okay. one more. Oh, Vajpayee. Vajpayee. Yeah. There's, of course, Mr. Shankar Vajpayee. Shankar. So, Has, four. Have done China, uh, Beijing and, uh, as well yeah. as Islamabad. Yeah. And w tell me something about it. Were you, like, were you tailed by the ISI? I'll tell you my experience as a journalist. We used to have, when we went in to cover whatever event. and uh, In fact, in one of them, you were managing the media and I was part of the delegation. Prime Minister Vajpayee, I think, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Or when he went for the... 
uh, one of the summits i don't okay. remember which one uh, but at that time um, we used to have you know people telling us and they would like say that ha hum aapko wahan le jate hain yahan le jate hain and everybody knew and it's the last day that you get to know that okay this guy was telling you everywhere yeah. but were you tailed ev- you all, all the time and all it's the- very openly done okay. and i can uh, tell you an anecdote uh, you know when you get old you get into your anecdote age so i seem <laughs> to be i have seemed to have fallen into that age category now but i remember very clearly that we had driven to lahore and there was a particular address which our drivers just couldn't find so the isi car and the isi man pulled up and he said are yaar for But 10 uh, minutes you have been going round and round just tell me which where you want to go and i'll take you there escort is it becomes an escort and not a tail so yeah. actually the isi came up and showed us where we had to go which was we were missing one small lane or something of that time barbaad kar raha hu but we was wasting <laughs> his time GPS trying era. time barbaad kar rahe the so um, you know he he drove up and he said tell me and i'll take you where you want to go So you know uh, you've been uh, uh, ambassador in Beijing so I will I will speak to you about this BRICS uh, alliance and stuff uh, before that uh, Raja let me come to you you know uh, China wants to integrate Pakistan into the BRICS alliance and uh, India's of, of course opposing that uh, what is your view about this look i i i don't i don't think it's a serious thing at least at this stage mm. the in the list of 22 countries uh, who've been already invited to come uh, the, Pakistan is not there mm. I mean, it's it's you know, we can believe that look, China at some time would want to get them in, mm. but India has a veto, so I I don't think it's on the cards uh, anytime soon that that will actually happen. The debate really is about what about these twenty two other countries who are friends of both, say for example, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, countries like that. I mean, who are all want to get in in one form or the other. So that's where it is. Pakistan is still not in the front and center of the expansion debate. Uh, but i think what india is saying is let's first work out the criteria again that statement will come out uh, today hmm. at the end of the day today 24th uh, august i think we'll get a sense of what they agreed hmm. whether they're actually going to announce some names who are going hmm. to be taken in and if they get taken in i doubt if they'll become full members it's like uh, you know are they observers you know the tired two tired three tired structure that like asean has most international organizations have so all these are open at this point uh so membership doesn't mean anything at this stage you become an observer do you think pakistan is even trying no, uh, I, i think they they are they too uh, yeah. caught no, up I think they would love turn. to get in i mean they would the, love the, to, yes. on the chinese shoulders but but i don't think uh, it's not a serious uh, yeah, thing yeah, right now. Uh, so the destruction of uh, churches in pakistan even the uae and uh, other countries in the in west asia have criticized pakistan the west seems to be muted uh, in its response and china completely silent do you think that uh, this can become a big uh, issue or it will just be one of the things that happens no i think this has been a problem that has plagued pakistan not just for the recent mm. past but for almost its entire existence so it is a problem i don't think the west uh, being relatively muted means that they do not oppose the destruction of churches and the harassment of uh, people who are christian in their faith etc i don't think it means that they are not opposed to that but uh, it's something which has happened and in, in the past and you know the west has made its opposition its voice known on this subject so i think they may have been muted this time because they are also distracted by their own problems at home but uh, i can't see them not being opposed to this particular thing you know uh, i'll get to the cpec issue since uh, you were posted both in china as well as in uh, in uh, islamabad uh, there were these suicide attacks which have happened uh, the baloch uh, liberation army before i begin this question here's a primer On August 13th, 2023, just a day before the Pakistan Independence Day, one group of the outlawed Baloch Liberation Army (BLA) attacked a convoy of Chinese engineers at the Gawadar port. This attack was similar to the attack in 2021 when a suicide attack was carried out on a convoy of Chinese engineers. A day later, a Baloch group issued an ultimatum to China to vacate its operations and people from Balochistan. In April 2022, a woman suicide attacker killed three Chinese teachers at Karachi University. The attack was aimed at the Chinese affiliates of the Confucius Institute. What is going to be the future of CPEC, the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which incidentally India opposes? So the China-Pakistan uh, Economic the, uh, Corridor, the CPEC, 
Where does it stand? Do you think that China is rethinking on this billions of dollars, six billion or something like that? No, then? the investment what? originally was supposed to be sixty, then yeah. maybe about twenty-five, thirty already is coming. Yeah, but it? now the, just the Pakistan sector is uh, six billion, isn't it, or more? Sixty, no, much more. The origin, much that more. was the plan, but I think but it's maybe actual it's investments become, maybe in the, around twenty-five, okay. thirty. Okay, twenty-five, yeah. thirty billion. Yeah. So, what do you think? Do, is there a rethink? Will they uh, will they just give up on Gawadar? or are they going to continue with it despite these attacks no i don't think there's been a rethink at least in beijing mm. but the fact of the matter is that because of these two two and a half years of covid many of the projects under the belt and road initiative of which one part is the china pakistan economic corridor have slowed down and as a result of that we'll have to see how they progress now that covid is you know is over more or less all over the world uh the pakistanis of course welcome this investment because there is no other investment coming into pakistan hmm. the only investment is what the chinese government is uh, putting in under cpec and uh, chinese companies coming in and doing all kinds of projects including power projects and road projects rail projects etc uh but eventually it also matters whether all these projects will be viable and whether they will turn profitable and that is a big if that's a big question mark and we'll have to wait and see how that works out uh because you know as you rightly said there are uh, huge domestic economic problems that pakistan is grappling with and uh, even this investment for it to be viable and profitable uh, would require uh, you know pakistanis to make use of those projects so let's see how it happens Raja, just break this down for me, uh, for our viewers. Uh, the Belt Road Initiative, the CPEC part of it, and Balochistan. Where does uh, does this jigsaw uh, puzzle? How do the pieces yeah. fall? Look, I think uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is exactly this. Ten uh, years ago, that uh, Xi Jinping announced that they're going to do this big uh, infrastructure thing, both on uh, maritime side as well as uh, overland. So that was called the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. now what they did was like in all you know uh, governments what they, after they created this big umbrella they started shoving in the previous projects also underneath it hmm. so the actual china pakistan economic corridor precedes the announcement of the belt and road uh, over the years i mean in fact uh, musharraf was still there uh, you know i think hu jinta went there uh, to launch the port construction so i think this predates it because if you remember china was involved in pakistan's uh, at least two three major projects one was the karakoram highway that goes back to the 70s uh, that building you know between uh, xinjiang and the uh, you know pakistan occupied kashmir that uh, those connections this goes back to the 70s when it was very hard to to do engineering uh, across the karakorams so in many ways uh, what you think of the china pakistan economic corridor is really a modernization Okay. one you had to modernize the road across the karakoram and then you need a port and then connect the two down through the down the indus river in various uh, various forms so i think what they tried to do is really to to develop this but there are two problems that came up one in fact people like imran were questioning this project by the time he came to power he said look the cost of interest is very high so these are mostly loans this is not uh, that you have to pay back so the cost the interest cost that was going up so in fact imran one of the many damages he did you can say to the pakistani he asked the right questions but the chinese were very upset with him and because he was some commentators in india say that imran is the best thing to happen yeah. to to <laughs> india <laughs> because he asked questions which yeah. damaged uh, the pakistan exactly, army exactly, exactly. yeah so i think but i think they kind of hushed it up and mm. nawaz sharif the civilians were very big gung ho on on uh, cpec as well like nawaz sharif and zardari the second i think what is seen godar attacks on godar was really the baloch separatism that mm. exists so the baloch have a historic complaint even well before the chinese came that uh, the punjabis exploit their resources yeah. and they don't get any benefits so they find this long standing uh, anti you know central government agitations in balochistan it was crushed by bhutto in the 70s and now it's it's uh, again the government keeps attacking them and does all kinds of things and then what pakistan did was army announced a separate army unit right a security unit mm. to deal with the terrorist attacks and to protect the cpec across the board so my i don't see the chinese withdrawing from godar mm. mm. uh, in fact in india we focus so much on godar uh, but there is also the karachi port where the chinese already are building ships mm. 
So the naval integration of China and Pakistan already takes place in uh, in Karachi, where that is headquarters of the Pakistan Navy. Chinese Navy is building some ships for them. So the integration of the two navies uh, that is taking place. But overall, I mean, the main point about CPEC, Gwadar, is really how China has taken over the infrastructure development in Pakistan, and Pakistan does not have too many choices. And how do they manage it? That is the problem because the costs of these projects is going up. And one uncertainty, which uh, maybe Gautam can uh, tell us a little more, the Chinese economy itself is slowing down. Now mm. it's not so clear yeah. how well the C, uh, the BRI as a whole, the investments plan if will go. If it's viable or not. Yeah, or the longer term. Yeah, could you yeah. Uh, tell me? Is, if, do you think that that will happen? One, that uh, whether it fits in, and two, uh, is Pakistan okay being a client state of China? Because there's a lot of talk about that too in Pakistani press. Let me answer the second question first about whether Pakistan is uh, happy or satisfied or okay with being a client state. I think they don't have much of a choice mm. because there's no one else who is investing in Pakistan. And when you have this big brother China coming and saying that we'll do the China-Pakistan economic corridor, billions of dollars, you accept it. So to a certain extent, they don't have a choice and therefore they've accepted it. Though people in Pakistan will always tell you that, you know, we have nothing very common between the Chinese people and the Pakistani people. But I think where the nation states are concerned, their interests coincide. So uh, it's a, you know, they have to take it or, or, or then get into even worse kind of situation if they don't accept the kind of investments that China is putting in. Uh, as far as the first question is concerned, it's a, you know, th there's no doubt that there's a very severe slowdown in the Chinese economy. And that as a result of that, the Chinese economy is facing huge problems. And we have been seeing more of the problems over the past few weeks. But I think we still need to watch the Chinese economy a little more over the next six months to see where exactly it is headed. There's no doubt that there is high levels of uh, student unemployment, that is those students who are graduating and really large numbers of them are not getting jobs. You can see the real estate sector really crashing down, we, not only with Evergrande already uh, announcing bankruptcy, but there's another uh, big company which has thousands of projects across the country, which is also in deep trouble, not repaid its uh, loans to the banks, etc. So in the past, the Chinese used to overcome these problems by spending their way out of the problem. But today, with their domestic debt being very, very high, almost 300% of GDP, they're not even able to spend their way out of trouble and use it to produce and manufacture more in infrastructure. So China seems to be in a little bit of a problem. Mm. Uh, in my opinion, the problem is as follows. But I, I, you know, it's not that I'm advising Xi Jinping on it because if he's making mistakes, I will let him make those <laughs> yeah. mistakes. But... That's Chanakya Niti for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I can share with all of you, with you, Smita, with you, Raja, and with your viewers and listeners, that I think the basic problem in my view, which was made by Xi Jinping, is that the Chinese economic miracle created by Deng was done through a devolution of economic decision-making. Mm. Economic decision-making was let down and was allowed to be made by the smallest province, by the smallest, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, the principality, etc. Earlier in the Mao period, it was all centrally done in, in Beijing. So Beijing used to decide that some steel mill somewhere in a different part of China will produce so many tons of steel. Which is communism for which you. Was, which is classic communism. Yeah. Now, uh, Deng Xiaoping changed that by devolving economic decision-making powers. Unfortunately, what Xi Jinping has done is reverse that whole process. He has re-centralized not just political decision-making in his own hands, but also economic decision-making in the hands of the state-owned enterprises. Hmm. In the action he has taken against the uh, various private sector players in China, we have seen Jack Ma having to yep. run away from China, etc., etc. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so I think by re-centralizing economic hmm. decision-making, he has sort of undone the Deng Xiaoping miracle, which was the Chinese miracle of 10% uh, or more GDP growth per annum over 40, 45 years. So I think that's a, a, a basic problem in China. But we need to wait and watch what's happening with the Chinese economy for another six months before coming to any hard and fast conclusions right. is what I would say. 
Uh, I'm going to come to your article. In that, Raja, you write, uh, UAE has offered to bring new and significant investments into Pakistan that could pull it out of the unending cycle of economic crisis and bailout packages. And India, which has seen a rapid transformation of bilateral relations with the UAE under PM Modi, might not be averse to seeing the UAE play a key role in promoting Pakistan's economic stability and making it a part of trade and and investment flows between the Gulf and South Asia. Would in India agree to this, Raja? No, I mean, I, I think in any case, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so so I think, what's, I think uh, coming back to Imran Khan, I mean, and see, he really wrecked the economy too. Hmm. Uh, so he went into the IMF, they, you know, 22nd time or 23rd time, now we're in the 24th version. Which earlier, before he became PM, had said that he would not be like Nawaz yeah. Sharif or uh, yeah. like Zardari. He would not go with yeah. a begging bowl to IMF. So once and he, he changed, went to them right. and then walked out halfway huh. saying that, look, this is too expensive. I don't want to do this because I don't want to incur the cost, political costs of it. So that made it even worse because mm. if they had stayed with the program by now, maybe they would have been in a better shape. So they pulled out. Uh, so I think the, the problem now is it's really the economy is in such a bad shape. Now they went back because the, the Nawaz Sharif people were also not very happy to go back to the IMF because for mm -hmm. any politician, they say, look, why should I pay the cost? Uh, because if you want to come back and win the elections, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want. But the, I think one reason why the army took over, I think, de facto in Pakistan, is to get the economy fixed, go back to the IMF, and now assembled a technocratic government which will do the necessary job and here again, they have a long tradition of getting technocratic governments to do their bidding. But this time, I think what's happened, the difference which I was pointing out to was, every time they were broke, they would go to Saudis, they would go to the Chinese, yeah. give me one billion, two billion, you know, take one America billion. America too? No, America won't give that kind of money. You know, this no. is really the, you know, okay. Americans say go to IMF. No. But what, what happened with the Gulf is, give me oil facility, free oil, you know, deferred payment. Uh, two, two billion, one billion, and take one billion from you and I give it to Gautam because I'm indebted to, to both of you. So they were playing this game. I think the UAE, the sheikhs told them, look, don't come each time begging. That, why don't you start selling your assets? Mm. I mean, the nicer word for it, privatization, asset monetization, we all use the economic jargon. They're basically they're saying, do reform. Now, to, to our viewers, just explain what the assets mean. You mean yeah, airports, uh, ports? Yeah, yeah, for example, I mean, mm. the Karachi port, total about 10 berths, they've just handed over to the Abu Dhabi port company. Mm. Islamabad airport is being privatized. So what they're saying is the strategy for the technocratic government is, look, and the army is taking a front, and front role in this, which is to say, they set up something called Special Investment Facilitation Council or something like the committee. Mm which was going to fast track, cut through all the bureaucratic stuff, no due diligence. Mm. We say, look, sell, sell, sell to the right bidders in a G2G contract, mm. circumvent the procedure so that you generate the resources to manage the economy. Now, you know, I, this is, you can say this is a good strategy or not, but the fact is they've come to a point where the army thinks this is the only way to go forward. Uh, and in any case, and the Americans have told them, look, go to the IMF. IMF is also saying privatize. So the Gulf has the money. In fact, that's a point I was saying. Historically, yeah. we thought of the Gulf really as a, as a labor market rather than today. The Gulf sovereign wealth funds have close to $5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Money they want to invest around the world. If you saw the newspapers today. For privilege. Not privilege. It's money to, to profit. Yeah. If this is a good investment, I just come to okay. an example. Like today, uh, there was news in the papers, in Indian papers. Qatari sovereign wealth fund has invested... Almost, uh, what, uh, 100 billion or something? I mean, for just getting 1% stake in Reliance retail stake, less than 0.99% yeah. stake, they're yeah. willing to put money. So they have the money. They're looking to places to put the money. Uh, and Like in India, you know, uh, Ambani's were in talks with... And it's uh, not as if Qatar and India have great relationships. No, that doesn't mean it's money. it's just it's really, the money. Yeah, it's money. It's, it's like, just, yeah. yeah. Either you green go to New York or... Not greenbacks. Yeah. What is India's currency? <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it? Whatever. Either yeah. you, so what are the four major financial centers? Like you have New York, you have London, you have Hong Kong, you have now Shanghai, of course. Huh. So s similarly, now Gulf has emerged as a place where there's money, money to be deployed. Because 40 years, they've accumulated so much oil wealth. Huh. It is sitting in the banks and huh. they're willing to put the money for profit. So I think that's where they have the capacity today. And so they've told these guys, Pakistanis, look, you start reforming, you sell your private public sector assets and we can put in the money so that long term you have actually a different strategy 
than going around with a begging ball, asking for money from everyone. The army seems to have bought into this line. This won't be popular uh, because you basically, in India, you would say, look, handing over your Crown family jewels, jewels yeah. uh, to uh, foreigners without even due diligence. Like, we're not doing, we're also privatizing. We're also, you know, inviting FDI. But here is like wholesale handing over to foreign companies. But the fact is, if that's what they're going to do, uh, I think that's where uh, UAE, which has become very friendly to us, to and, India. Yeah, hmm. and the Saudis. I mean, if they kind of step into Pakistan, put some economic common sense into Pakistan's head, one is to get money. Hmm. Other is to say, look, open up trade. I mean, anybody would have told them. You know, it's not that Pakistanis themselves, Zadari government, Nawaz Sharif government, both, they wanted to trade with India. Uh, simple things across Punjab, between Lahore and Amritsar, I mean, they can get so many things much cheaper. But because of the, you know, antipathy to India, they were not willing to do it. And the army finally changed under General Bajwa. But when 2021, remember, we had a ceasefire. After the ceasefire, we were supposed to start the trade. Well, army was for the trade. Uh, Imran Khan said no. Hmm. Uh, so, so then I think that whole story ended there. But if anybody puts common sense into them, they look, open your borders, import things from India so that you can benefit like other neighbors of India are benefiting. Be more reasonable to Afghanistan. So that's the kind of strategy. If Pakistan actually takes such sensible advice, we should not complain for that. If they open up a trade, because right now where we are with Pakistan, they say for anything you say normal common sense thing, they say no, first all Kashmir. Hmm. Uh, we're not willing to trade with you. We're not willing to do sign any trade agreements with you. We're not willing to do even simplest things. They're not even willing to talk to you unless you reverse Article 370. But Delhi is not going to do that. So I think there is pressure on them to modify some of those positions. If that happens, we should say you're welcome. As long as you're ready to do business on a normal neighbor, India will be quite happy to do it. So, um, Gautam, I want to come to you about uh, two things from uh, Raja's article and what he said. One, does it begin with pure commerce and do they not want uh, privileges as in political privileges, geopolitical privileges? Would UAE not want that? Two, uh, is it a win-win situation if uh, Pakistan's economy does well? Because, uh, you know, for a long time we used to hear that our neighbors should do well. If they do well, it's good for India. There's another uh, opinion that when Pakistan does well, they attack us. So it's better that they are in the ruin. So there are two views about it. Uh, so tell me, what do you think? No, I think I'll pick up on one thing that Raja said, which is that if some of these other countries like the UAE or Saudi Arabia, are able to drill some common sense into Pakistan decision-makers' heads, that will be something which will be welcomed in India. Mm -hmm. And the first common sense thing to do is to open trade, because that is simple. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be possible to solve a Kashmir issue or to you know, do something with uh, uh, Article 370, etc., that's much more difficult. The politi politics of it is going to be much more difficult. The easiest step is to trade. And I think if trade were to be open between India and Pakistan, there are many studies which show that both countries will benefit. And if Pakistan experiences that benefit, we will also experience that benefit. But once they experience that benefit, I hope it will lead to greater common sense application in other things between our two countries. And then I would say that the future looks brighter. So I don't see Delhi opposing opening of certain linkages between the two countries, particularly on trade and commerce. I think we would welcome that. Okay. Uh, in your article, you also say that Pakistan's rental value is coming down and its importance for Washington has diminished. I'll come to you on the same topic because you've done a posting in uh, DC. So uh, you've seen when Pakistan was uh, had its rental value really high and we had to battle that as uh, you know because we are not an ally Pakistan was so has it diminished and to what extent uh, is it just because of Afghanistan or will they want to keep it alive and burning no I think it's genuinely diminished hmm. both uh, on its own absolute terms and in relation to India as well hmm. now the Afghanistan you mentioned I mean it's not Afghanistan was not a, a recent thing I mean it's almost a 50-year American engagement with Afghanistan. Yeah, we don't realize that. Yeah. See, Three generations or two generations yeah, of yeah, Afghans yeah, have seen that. Yeah. For example, going back to 1970s, when yeah. the first coup against uh, Zahir Shah took place, the Americans were involved, the Soviets and the Americans, and then the support 
the Western support to Pakistan, along with Shah of Iran, to create trouble in Afghanistan. So it goes back to that period. And it went through, the Soviet occupation took place, then the Americans supported them. The Soviet withdrew, the Taliban and others came in, that time also you needed Pakistan. Then after 9-11 they needed Pakistan. So I think this four and a half, nearly five decades of Pakistan's role has diminished. And Americans, once they switch off, they switch off. Hmm. Unless something else brings them five years down the road. So I think at this point, the Americans don't see a value because they're not really focused on Afghanistan or the Middle East the way they were for the last 20 years. The second aspect is America today is focused on China, on which actually that's the reason why they're more interested in India today. Mm. Because they need to balance China. And Pakistan still claims to be a good friend of China. Uh, so I think the relative interest, the circumstance, as long as it was focused on Afghanistan, Pakistan was the first policy to South Asia. A focus on China automatically changes the, the camera angle into something else. And that makes India far more consequential. That's why we have the Indo-Pacific and all that. A third point is India's weight relative to Pakistan has dramatically changed. I mean, there was a time till the mid-90s, you know, India and Pakistan was really per capita income was higher than ours. Uh, their economy was smaller, but the per capita income was higher. Today, Indian GDP is 10 times bigger than Pakistan's. 10 times. They're stuck at $330, $340 billion for a long time. India is at uh, $3.5 trillion. And the way the rupee is going, Pakistani rupee, $1 will get you 300 Pakistani rupees today. And India, India is still 80. So, so I think Pakistan is really, relative to India, has diminished. And not just in relation to India. Today, Bangladesh's per capita income mm. is a thousand dollars more than Pakistan's. That per really capita. bothers Pakistanis. Yeah. No, for example, yeah. I mean, you, you, because in Bangladesh they control the population growth rate and increase the economic growth rate. Pakistan has done the opposite. No control on the population growth rate. The economy has tanked. So the per capita incomes have really dramatically fallen as population grown. So I think it's really a serious, uh, on all counts, Pakistan's value has come down. But we shouldn't given our problems with them, say it's a, it's a permanent situation, they might come back. Mm. But at this point, the relative weight in the international system has gone down. And that's why, the, remember the Gulf Arabs used to be their best friends mm. because of religious solidarity, etc. But if you, there was a time when Pakistan was acting as a protector for them. Today, Pakistan goes with a hand outstretched. So the uh, Gulf has become richer. Pakistan is poorer. Hmm. And Pakistan's credibility, if you go back to the 1960s, Islam, under Ayub Khan, Pakistan was a, you know, great army. They would go in and help the, the sheikhs to defend them. The great friend of America, great friend of China, you know, Pakistan's weight was a, was a yeah. global thing. That has dramatically diminished. So the poorer you become, so this is a tragedy of Pakistan. Except nuclear weapons, they have nothing. Hmm. So I think that's where they, they're really yes. in a jam. Okay. And uh, that weight, and finally, I would say one more thing. There's a new problem for the for the Pakistanis. Remember you asked, yeah, Pakistan is willing to be a client state. Hmm. They're happy to be a client state for anyone as long as it works for them against India. Hmm. Right. So, But the problem today for them is China was a happy, uh, you know, boss for them. But today the problem is China and the United States are fighting. See, Pakistan had this great advantage. They had good relations with both US and China. While we had the opposite problem till recently, we had bad relations with both. Yeah. But today, I think when the Americans, if you want to get the American interest, you need to do something hmm. on China, on the China question. Pakistan has a problem. How does it adjust? This is where Imran Khan was trying to tilt uh, towards Russia, towards China. While well, the army chief is saying, was saying, look, we need to, we can't abandon the Americans because Pakistan elite is so tied to UK and US uh, that they don't want to give up the Western relationship. While well, uh -huh. China is putting pressure to cut their Western ties. Interesting. So I'm going to come two points from uh, Raja's answer. One is, has Pakistan's geopolitical luck run out, which he mentions in the uh, article too. Uh, and the second point is that did Imran make that cardinal mistake uh, of aligning with China and therefore America wanted to get rid of him because, uh, you know, if that, that's the new conflict, then Pakistan was putting its eggs in that basket. So, yeah. ha or has Pakistan agreed to put its eggs in China's basket? Yeah. No, so on the first question, I think what Raja said is right, that right now, at this point of time, the utility of Pakistan to, say, the United States is much lower than what it was earlier. 
largely because of Afghanistan, but also because of the regional situation uh, around Pakistan and, you know, uh, in that part of the world. So, uh, but whether it will continue to remain that way is anyone's guess. Suppose two years down the line, there's another conflagration in Afghanistan. Something happens which brings the attention of the US mm. and the whole Western world to Afghanistan. Russia, maybe? Then Pakistan would again go up in their eyes. Their, yeah. Its weightage, its importance, its need would also go up. Its requirement would go up in the eyes of the West. So we have to wait and see and see how things play out. But at this point of time, there's no doubt that the attention that Washington gives to Pakistan is much lower than it used to be in the past. So there's no doubt about that. Um, about aligning with the Chinese, the Ch no. The let me first uh, come to that. Is it is it a bipartisan thing in that that the Democrats and Republicans I both? Think, I think it's bipartisan. It's bipartisan. As is as is the issue of working closely with India mm. in the Indo-Pacific in the Quad. And what is not mentioned or is mentioned very often in the US, less so in India, is that to work closely in order to ensure that China doesn't get too big for its boots. Hmm. So there's no doubt about that, that the requirement or the need for working with India is much greater in Washington today than to work with Pakistan. Okay. But again, that will change if circumstances change. Hmm. Suppose there was another conflagration or something blew up in Afghanistan, the need for them to work with uh, Pakistan would once again flare up. So we need to uh, watch that situation closely. About aligning with China, Smita, I think, the, the, you know, it's, it's not something which is very recent. It's, it dates back to 1971 hmm. when, um, you know, when Pakistan played a sort of intermediary role in the rapprochement between China on the one hand and the U.S. You know that um, uh, uh, Kissinger once flew to Pakistan and then disappeared there for two days. He was actually on a visit to China. And that then uh, moved into, you know, the visit paid by President Nixon to China, etc., etc. So Pakistan has played that role between the two. Uh, and it has been close to, pa to China for quite some time now, over the decades. And it has only increased as China's strength has increased, as China's economic might has increased. Uh, and we spoke about that earlier in the program about how China is the only country really which is investing in in Pakistan today. I can't believe that it's <laughs> 2023 and we are still discussing Kissinger. And he, for all you know, he might still again play a role in doing that. Just turned 100. Yeah, he's, he's just visited China recently. Yeah, exactly. As a 100-year-old or whatever, 19-year-old. Yeah, 100, 100, 100, 100 still, year old, okay. Right, we're still discussing it. He's outlived all those guys, the naysayers. Yeah. Anyway, I'm quoting an article uh, from uh, an article in which uh, it says, uh, Pakistan is unlikely to become part of the anti-China balancing co coalition, which uh, you were mentioning. Pakistan is also not inclined to accept a geopolitical role secondary to India. Of course, it'll whether it is in a position to do that or not is yeah. debatable. Uh, then the article says, even in a US-led geopolitical dispensation, it's unwilling to play that role. So then the question arises is whether Pakistan is in a position to negotiate that at all, that it doesn't want to be uh, in a position to take a uh, take you know, or lay down terms for that matter to the US if it is called upon to do so? No, they can't. I mean, I think when you're broke hmm. and you're looking for money from others, you don't have that leverage. I think that is the problem. The Whoever wrote this article from Pakistan, their problem is to come to terms with this reality. Hmm. See, Pakistan has had an elite that was utterly disinterested in economics. They thought somebody will come and bail them out. Americans, Chinese, mm. uh, Saudis. So they never paid attention to economic reform of building something in the country. And because there was no popular governments, there was no pressure to deliver to the people. So now, but they find themselves in a real mess. So whatever the ambitions were, three things go. One, parity with India. Going back to the partition, the Congress and the Muslim League, the parity was a central notion in the idea of Pakistan, that they're equal to India. If not, more equal More, than India. Yeah. They used to yeah, think yeah, that. Yeah. To but today I think they are struggling to come to terms with the fact that they are one-tenth of India's size. And you remember there was a controversy when General Bajwa, in one of his, you know, when this crisis in the Pulwama Balakot was going on, he said, look, we can't fight the Indians. I mean, this is not being quoted. Mm. So you are not in a position to take on India. So those who fully understand it are willing to say it. But as a collective... 
as an ideology because there's been read on this or oh, we'll take on india we're equal to india that problem for them is a principal obstacle to the common sense that we talked about that mm. and this requires i think a very fundamental change whether it'll happen or not we can't be sure second uh, to idea to say look we'll never go against china I mean, that i think is because they've been stuck with china for so long that's where there is a debate in pakistan one lot saying look we can't abandon the americans they've been our best friends and the army is actually trying to take them back closer to the americans without finishing off the china relationship but i think that squeeze is going to grow as the yeah. us china tension grows i think here again imran the damage he did uh, also to the gulf hmm. for example imran thought he can join turkey and malaysia to contest the leadership of the islamic world with saudi arabia so so what the army has done in the last few years is to clean up after him the army chief bajwa went to saudi arabia please ignore this guy you know really mm. we want you to be with us he's been to america two three times mm. saying that look we'll get rid of this guy and you know it's not that america didn't have to remove him he had enough problems with the army uh, to saying that look we want to keep this relationship some are going uk is the the best friend uh, and with china they'll try and manage but if it comes to a real tension between us and china they, they're in a bad place mm. how they how they manage it but the the elites links to the west are so deep yeah. as you said look they have no clue to china if china is supporting them for the strategic reasons mm. but they're so comfortable london they all have homes in london dubai and yeah. in uh, in they new york they shop in new york yeah, and yeah. in so in, so their elite uh, has a and, and not in beijing or <laughs> shanghai or, or hong no, kong no. for that matter they don't i you know uh, gautam you remember like uh, 20 years ago the access that the pakistanis mm. used to have in washington indians didn't have that yeah. kind of oh, access no, we didn't. right we didn't. it was it was hard and now they don't get to meet their heads of state heads yeah. of government uh, their army chief no no Doors bilawal, don't open. bilawal when they at yeah. least six times barely once he got to see blinken the us secretary of state yeah so i think they really have a problem even seeing at the level of You know, so it's not level. as if you know there was a bubble of unreality that the Pakistanis were functioning under, where they thought that uh, India is nothing and we are powerful. They were in some kind of they still are the parity is still a bubble. No, they they can't shake that off. No, but it, what I'm saying is that there's that one bubble, yes, where they believe that they they are important to the world. but they were in some ways of because course, of what i'm course, saying yes, was yeah, that the access to power that they, they had were, they were in the cold war I mean, yeah. Were, yeah. Uh, even after the cold yeah. war i mean the 9/11 after yeah, that yeah post that there was a utility for pakistan and one yeah. would see that and it used to really annoy many of us who used to think that what is this that this country you want to give them so much of access whereas our prime minister goes there we matter yeah. you know we were a billion population already we were a, we were a, a democracy and yet here was a democracy the most powerful democracy in the world wouldn't give us the time of day true so you, why? i don't know if you were there in 2005 smita when uh, prime minister manmohan singh mm. visited yeah. the white house and i was with all the all the even journalists even before that we didn't even get a bottle of water Wa- yes someone had to bring it in one of the indian journalists in washington brought Yeah, boxes of water bottles, and then handed it to all of But us. But even before that, even before Dr. Manmohan Singh, when yeah. you were in the PMO yeah. of Mr. Vajpayee, do you remember at that time, General Musharraf? He was, I mean, General Musharraf was given VIP treatment in New York, and our Prime Minister wouldn't be on the TV shows there. Uh, no See, way. I think it is interest driven. You know, I mean, yeah. I think it is completely yeah. interest driven, and, and also driven by uh, the power you wield, mm. and as. Uh, Raja has been at pains to say we are a three point five, three point seven five trillion dollar economy. It's just that maybe the fifth largest in the world. But if you look at it from a purchasing power parity uh, model, India is the third largest economy in the world. China is the largest. The US is second largest, and we are third. And what is beginning to happen in geopolitics is that these three largest mm. economies in the world. are now beginning to circle each other and play around with each other and which the third largest and the second largest are coming together yeah, yeah. again which is the why largest. when america when you hear uh, american saying oh india the democracy and all is it tero bhai hum pehle bhi democracy the tab to tumko nahi dikh raha tha you were not willing to accept our free media problem, of democracy you know, uh, smita we also had a problem no? we were in love with soviet union ha huh. we had say 
in the first decades after independence it's not to criticize nehru but you you had adopted a socialist path mm. i don't know if you remember we threw out ibm from india mm. we today we talk about it superpower yeah 1977 we told ibm you can get lost so i think we also we were in a coke also <laughs> yeah, yeah. coke was okay but ibm you know which is <laughs> coke was okay yeah. ibm no, but it let them very, back it was very significant if you yeah. remember our swadeshi jagran began there yeah, 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 with 77 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i know and you know i remember siemens german company came mm-hmm. to india in 1970s to say look we got we can work with you on the let's have a comprehensive deal with bhel we will produce you know electrical equipment here and we said no 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 we don't do we won't let for we don't want foreign technology yeah they went to china and the entire power production equipment we import from china was made with german collaboration and the high speed trains in china they're mm-hmm. being made with german collaboration so we were also in a very bolshi as you say yeah. mode is we don't need anybody you know we we non aligned yeah, non aligned and socialist and self aligned so so mm-hmm. that was a problem so we were also not easy to get along with get along with for america yeah for i mean for the west as a whole i mean hmm. Uh, you remember that famous uh, uh, comment of Mrs. Gandhi when she was asked by a Western journalist and saying, "Which way does India lean?" Uh, and she turned around saying, "We don't lean. Hmm. We stand we upright, stand upright, or sit upright, or whatever." Nineteen eighty-one, when, when yeah. she went to the US. To the US, yeah. right? And but when she was rebuffed in the seventies, just before during the Bangladesh uh, uh, problem that we had just before the war, uh, she she had. a tough time so she was and of course the legacy of which you mentioned uh, of non alignment and nehruvian the economic choices we made the nehruvian so she had not yeah we had yeah. Uh, very little interest in trade we had very little interest in foreign direct investment so we shut our economy huh. uh, whatever but that's a history but look i think what has changed is look india matters today you can say simply 10 times more than pakistan Huh. and that 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 goes into the calculation of the americans uh, europeans everyone today mm-hmm. when they look at you you are a big market you are a big military power you are a technology powerhouse so people are willing to come to you this where i think pakistan's failure I mean, even a smaller country than pakistan could have invested in these things but they just didn't yeah, yeah. they were in this mode you know talwar chalao you know that, uh, huh. you know jihad yeah. and we'll kind of we are so important we can keep doing this nonsense yes. see smita you know uh, pakistan defines itself as a national security state i don't know why it does so but th- that's how it defines i- itself and a national security state is something which is the antithesis or the opposite of a state which places a lot of importance on economic growth Welfare economic state, development huh? though of course you have to remember that when you speak of national security economic security is an integral part yeah. of national security but because of defining itself as a national security state where the army played an outsized role and continues to play an outsized role it has focused more on as raja said the talwar rather than on making bread and increasing the size of the pie even the space people. program right hmm. there's that realization uh they started actually yeah, art, yeah yesterday and uh, on social media and today in the uh, pakistan media it's all about wo chand pe pahunch gaye and look at our you know their, their organization which is the equivalent of isro is all headed by uh, army people it's not headed yeah. by uh, scientists it's interesting they started their they space to, program whatever we did they did you know yeah. Yeah. so we started a space program there also 60s i think they never really invested or really developed a cadre of you also need scientists you need yeah. People not that we invested in a lot yeah. f- no, for a long time we didn't we yeah. were able to make do with what we invested what we could invest and what the education we could. you know the scientific education and which really yeah the temper really yeah, yeah the scientific temper i'm yeah. going to uh, quote one art uh, apart from uh, uh, an extract from raja's article uh, in which he says the uae has facilitated back channel talks between new delhi and rawalpindi that led to the ceasefire agreement in february 2021 but uh, after that you know no follow up we talked about trade you write in your article that and we talked also that trade would um you know both countries would benefit with that but is there capital in see there's rawalpindi mm. there is lahore everybody's decision making is separate is there much capital in pakistan to improve india pakistan uh, ties at this stage in no. delhi there isn't it seems No, in Delhi there isn't because when you talk to someone across the table, it can be any country, any government. You assume an iota of common sense from the other side. Hmm. Uh, if there's no common sense, then where where can there be a meeting of minds? Where can you actually work together to do something? 
so uh, if there is common sense which may be driven by other reasons could be driven by their economic problems then i think delhi will be able to engage with uh, with uh, people in pakistan uh, but but we have to wait and see whether that actually happens because there has to be some give and take from both mm. sides you know mm. and if there's no give there's only asking i want this i want kashmir to be solved i want uh, 370 to be brought back etc that's not that's a non starter then there's no way i will even sit with uh, anyone from pakistan to talk about our other and this domestic and politics also isn't it gautam there is a bit of domestic politics but i think you know it's the army which has to decide because army is running everything in pakistan now mm. and always uh, did for the last so many years i, I would say and they yeah. never focus so much on the economics of mm. it as raja has been pointing out and they should have because mm. economic security is an integral part of national security mm. Mm. I think Delhi is not that Delhi has no interest. I mean, it's a question of terms. Huh. After all, don't forget. After all, India negotiated with Pakistan a ceasefire agreement, right? Yeah. That was negotiated uh, on the back channel by the Indian, uh, reportedly by the Indian National Security Advisor, directly dealing with the Pakistani Army Chief. So we do negotiate. The problem was, what are the terms? If the terms are you reverse uh, August fifth, twenty nineteen, that's not there. I think this where General Bajwa was giving, showing some flexibility. Let's start with ceasefire. Let's restore high commissioners. Let's start trade. That was the plan, but I think Imran was the problem, and he undermined it. Which is why I said Rahul Pindi and Islamabad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not so Islamabad the, in yeah, Delhi. Yeah, it's not uh, Islamabad in Delhi. So I think today, if things stabilize at this point, I don't think they're in a the, the new army chief is in a huge problem himself. He has to stabilize, and so this will take. When we are also getting into an election mode, so I would say sometime next year, if things are in a reasonable shape, probably. Uh, by the time they would recognize that look they need to have more economic cooperation with their neighbors then i think we'll be in a different place the so question is the terms national security economy is important as gautam said but there's also internal politics one is that pakistan's internal mess which is happening they need to resolve resolve that i'm sure that is priority for them even in india if you see that mr modi had invested a lot of personal capital into it when he flew to lahore oh, yeah. and uh, you know and then he we got the rebuff after that so do you think that in a pre election year no that's what i said not not no before choice. elections it's really i think both sides hmm. assuming at some point pakistan will have elections next year hmm. we have ours due in may so by the time the new government comes in now it's only 8 months left and rapprochement with pakistan has never been oh, no no rapprochement is too strong about i mean too strong to about it okay even basic talking look there was a plan on february 2021 after the ceasefire you could take very small steps that's where you'll start when you pick up the threads to say look where do we go from here if they're willing to uh, engage in that i think uh, delhi will be open i believe after the once the new government comes in uh, you know uh, talks with pakistan uh, i'm sure you will say yes because but when i say that should it be held outside of media glare and will that mm-hmm. result in yeah. no absolutely i say i <laughs> yeah, say yes. I <laughs> uh, but but let me also say that's that like keep the media out keep the media out motherhood <laughs> and apple pie as no, far as the mea is concerned no but let me also say smita that uh, you know i i agree with what um, raja is saying that there have to be certain conditions not not preconditions but certain conditions under which talks can move ahead if there is a complete uh, no, no meeting of minds no scope for any kind of negotiation or discussion then i'm not pressing for talks i'm not the one who's saying that india must talk to pakistan because xx and y or z or something of that sort B- what we're doing currently is perfectly fine we are not talking we're not but yes when the talks do take place they should be held outside uh, outside the media mm-hmm. glare and i have one other small point to make if you permit me mm-hmm. uh, smita you know unfortunately i don't know maybe it's something to do with the pakistani system they always want talks at the highest level it foreign minister should talk this is not the way diplomacy is conducted you have to build it up little by little from the bottom so first per- perhaps directors or joint secretaries should meet there must be some agreement that they come to then build it up and then finally the pri- foreign ministers or the prime ministers can meet and and announce something big it doesn't work the other way where you call musharraf uh, you know and and hope to get something signed uh, while he's yeah. in in delhi okay. for one and a half days or in agra for one and a half days that doesn't work you have to build it up from the bottom and that's how it's done with every other country 
and uh, so the pakistanis need to understand that that it has to be built up from the bottom not pushed from the top yeah they used to uh, always insist that you know it's going to be sm krishna only who hmm. will talk with yeah. sm qureshi yeah. it will only be chidambaram who will talk with rehman malik you know there was there was that to thing yeah. yeah that our prime minister our foreign minister will only talk with whereas when those talks used to be held after every half hour they would go out of the room i mean this was told to us off the record they would go out of the room talk and they would come back whereas our guys would keep sitting and you know like okay nothing is moving forward because the it is from pindi yeah, that yeah, the yeah. directions were coming yeah so it has to be from the bottom up and mm. not from the top force downward because you know at the topmost level you can't make a decision instinctively mm. and instantaneously you which to, we saw in agra yeah, yeah. yeah. that yeah. that those talks collapsed because musharraf wanted mr vajpai to take that decision then and there i think i think we've learned from you know this Who experience i think our system i mean i would say india yeah but, but what about pakistan has it learned no I, i think for them i think the problem is not uh, they're really in a bad shape the question is how much are they willing to change i think look i'm at some point they have to decide which way they go it might not necessarily be in our favor but i think for them as we said look they are in the middle of a major financial crisis a security crisis after supporting taliban for so many decades mm. now taliban is turning against them yeah they don't They're have good relations with india yes americans don't give them you know the too time much time day. and the chinese uh, are there but but that's not enough so so i think for them really they're at a denou mine I, I I think there should be no wishful thinking in Delhi, and I think we are never wish, you know, expect too much from them. But the fact is, if you look at them on their own terms, they are in a, a complex situation. At some point, they are going to make choices, which whether it is selling their assets to uh, UAE or doing trade with India or restoring ties with the US or putting down terrorism for their own interest, because even the Gulf countries are telling them, look, you can't do what you're doing. Hmm. it hurts everybody iran is gone stronger what they do in balochistan also affects iran so so i think you have uh, they are under pressures now that doesn't mean you'll make wise decisions under pressure but the point is i think uh, ch- some change will happen in pakistan which is good or bad we'll decide on on the see how it actually unfolds but i think this really after 75 years they're in a real bad shape what do you think uh, gautam finally i mean just while concluding west asia playing a larger role in stabilizing uh, pakistan is that doable uh, and uh, do you see india being okay with that look west asia could play a role mm. especially countries like the uae they could play a role but eventually it depends on whether you know the pakistani mindset changes i am not uh, you know i'm not in the business of trying to predict whether they are going to become more uh, reasonable or mm. more common sensical uh, i only hope that they will be more common sensical because then we will actually be able to have talks about something substantive like beginning trade in a small way or other issues so i i hope for the best but you've i cannot you've lived there for 3 years I you cannot would, predict uh, <laughs> what will happen you've lived there for 3 years so tell me do you ever see like a pattern in uh, pakistan do they buck the trend and do something for their own benefit for their no, for the others, benefit so of uh, yeah no, for they, their people they should be because you know that's how uh, people you know who are in office would tend to think what is good for my country hmm. at least in india i can vouch for the fact because i worked for several governments of india that every uh prime minister or foreign minister always did what was good for the nation and for the country so uh, i do hope that happens in pakistan also maybe they are doing what they think is good for the country but as we have been discussing they have uh, totally neglected over the last 20 25 years the economic scenario in pakistan yeah. which has brought them to the current situation that they're in right now uh if that uh, uh, brings them to change then that will be a happy augury you know this uh, this this word the term which pakistani uh, establishment i mean the army always says and plants it in the media that the the political uh, uh, parties zati mufat it's only for personal aggrandizement that the pakistani political parties come to power so there's this the holy grail is the army now people of pakistan seem to be 
saying i mean that's what we are seeing on social media and traditional media too that this zati mufat is even there in the pakistan army plotistan is the word that they <laughs> use for the army this stuff that they knew probably in the back of their minds but they are now verbalizing yeah. it that is one step towards realization no, isn't I mean, it I, i would i would just say look because in the end the guy with the lati wins hmm the problem Then is you become a total punjabi <laughs> living no. in this city jiski laathi uski bhais see so in the end see look at the, what's what's happened in the last few years huh. the whole narrative that the army constructed imran is a clean guy nawaz sharif and zadari are absolutely corrupt so let's throw out the old parties let's bring imran khan and we will use him to build a new naya pakistan hmm. that was the slogan 5 yeah. years ago 2018 they created this narrative P- politicians are corrupt Imran is a non-politician. He's a clean guy. The problem is he's, he's turned against them. Mm. So, no, but the problem is he's Imran doesn't have the lot. You know, he might have the people. Yeah. But the, by attacking the cantonments, etc., you know, now the army has used that opportunity to crack down. So the ball is back in the army's court. So, so I think the I, I I don't see them weakening. Actually, they've come back thanks to the mistakes Imran Khan made but now they it the they have to make the judgments on mm. foreign policy on economic policy on which they've security. always done anyway from yeah. behind so, the so scenes so i think but you know the hybrid game front office mein koi hai i mean is back office running yeah, the yeah, show yeah. to one where they have to now actually take charge of uh, this way when you have the technocrats yeah. everyone knows where the actual uh, office and is and the buck stops at you yeah, openly yeah, yeah, now yeah, yeah. right and that's why the army chief is presenting himself into saying look i'll sit on the investment council i'll lead the economic discussions yeah. so it also it's, makes it's india might... realize that that you know which pakistan have always said that openly you have to deal with pindi and not with yeah, islamabad yeah. i think and that, that's what i think india is now probably doing the ceasefire agreement came the through scenes. the engagement with pindi not yeah. with not with, yeah, not with islamabad there was nobody to engage with in islamabad yeah, in islamabad true anyway on that note thank you so much gentlemen for being part of the podcast and giving us all this gyan hmm. and demystifying pakistan for us thank you thank you so much it's a pleasure thank you. to be here with Thanks. you thank you thank you Thank you for watching or listening to this podcast. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste, Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.